Um, I want to get into the tool makeup, and, and that'll be part of that. I wasn't making fun of you, by the way. Though. Just take it in good humor. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So we've got the grinder, and we've got the wheels. If you look at the label on wheels, most of us deal with uh, woodworking supply places, wood turning supply places, and that's where we buy the wheels from. They are already designed for what we do. But if you were to buy them from ENCO and uh, MD MSC and all, MSC, all those places, they're designed for the metal industry. Then you have to look at the hardness of the wheel. We want a J or a K. That's what we want, because for the tools that we sharpen, it's very important that they're the right hardness. Too soft, they wear away in no time. Too hard, they really won't grind very well. Which brings me up to something very interesting, grinding. We grind our tools once, and we sharpen them many, many times. Grinding is actually the shaping of the tool to get it to the profile that we want. That's something that a lot of wood turners don't understand. Anybody here have the David Ellsworth grind bowl gouge? Do you have one? Okay. Anybody have the Mike Mahoney bowl gouge? No. How about the Richard Raffin turning tools? Or the Bonnie Klein turning tools? Or all those with somebody's name on it? They get a dollar per tool, by the way, for having their name on it. You pay $35 or $40 more. I defy anybody here to continue to have that same grind. Is yours ground exactly the same way that it was ground when you bought it? No, oh, okay. I guarantee it's already different. The reason for that is they grind these things to just some arbitrary grind that he puts his name on. And whether it works for you or not, it's a personal thing. Your grind is personal. It works for you. That. But the grind should be something that you want, that works for you. The way you turn, what you turn, the way you stand, the kind of wood you turn. All that has to do with the grind on that particular tool. Not because it said David Ellsworth said it works for him. And I'm not picking on David Ellsworth, but all those tools with name grinds on them. I can't tell you how many times I've done this seminar where people brought in their own tools. Hey, could you take a look at this? And I must have seen a hundred David Ellsworth grind you know, tools, and not a single one had an Ellsworth grind on it. Not one. And the reason for that is people don't realize, first of all, that's probably not his grind. I know Mike Mahoney real well. He's a good friend of mine. I've been to his house, what, three weeks ago? Two weeks ago? Anyway, um, his grind, he hasn't used in five years. And they're still selling it as his grind tools. It's a marketing thing. Henry Taylor picked up on it, decided to sell it, and said, this is the Mike Mahoney bowl set series. Three tools, get it for $350. He gets a bucket piece on the tools. And he hasn't used that grind in years. So what are you buying, actually? You're buying what you think is, is his, you know? Give an example. Uh, a couple years ago, he got into the bowl making, um, uh, bowl blank business. He, he and a partner, had, we're starting to make cores and ball blanks and things like that. And if anybody looked at the AW in Louisville, you would have seen it. He had these huge shipping crates filled with blanks. And people are lining up buying his dried cores. Okay? <laughs> and when they're done, they think they have a Mike Mahoney bowl. <laughs> now, it's interesting because we have his bowls. And he was charging more for those blanks than we charge for his finished bowls. And the people are lined up buying them because they think, oh, it's a Mike Mahoney bowl. <laughs> no, it isn't. It's a piece of wood. Yes? You're mentioning all these names and the grains. What's the difference in them? Is it the angle or, or what is it? The difference? Um, when I get into the actual grinds, um, the grind is specific to you. This is a grind that might have worked for him years ago. And when they decided to market something with his name on it, they had to put something. So they just made that grind. Is it his particular grind? It was at one time. Is it still now? I don't think he turns much anymore. So I couldn't answer that question. But it's just, it's just a, a name that they figured out they can get $35 more if it's got his name. And across the black handle, in sort of gold like this, it says David Ellsworth. You know, that's, that's really all it is. You know, you're not getting anything different. Yes. I got a question. Uh, what you're saying essentially is, as long as you get the high speed seal, and you put your grind on it, you're fine. Exactly. What's the difference between high speed? Uh, there's a big difference between high speed seal from China and high speed steel seal from England. Yes. How how do you tell you're getting the good stuff? If it's made in Sheffield, England, it's good. Now, <laughs> now wait a minute. Now, the AAW Alan Lacer a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, maybe, or maybe maybe a year ago, what he did was he went to all these companies. You know, like. Um, Again, I hate to drop names while we're here, but you know, Highland, whatever they're called this week, Highland Hardware, Highland Woodworking, Highland something. They have ba Badger, is their house brand, Badger. Um, Woodcraft has uh, Pinnacle. 
A lot of the stores, uh, Penn State has uh, Uncle Willie's Best or something, you know. Anyway, so what he did was he took all those tools and brought them to a metallurgist and had them checked. And they're all listed as high-speed steel. And none of them were high-speed steel. Not, not one of them was high-speed steel. Uh, another thing, if you look at Pinnacle, and that's a big problem. Could you clarify that a little bit? High speed steel has a very specific definition. The Rockwell that definition a little bit considerably, most of them, but most of them were still hard steel. They weren't carbon steel. Well, the Rockwell rating, the Rockwell rating was not met in any case. That's, that's high speed steel is considered within, I think it's 62 to 65 Rockwell. I think that's what it is. I'm sorry. Depends upon how you temper. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But the quality of the steel wasn't suitable to be hardened to that hardness because it becomes very brittle, brittle and they break. So they did tests on all of them and not one of them was what it was reported to be. And so my recommendation is deal with the, na the name companies and buy the best you can afford. I learned a long time ago working with tools that I'm gonna use and buy the best that I can afford because I don't wanna buy them two, three, four times and my safety is worth something. Um, years ago there was a lot of tools that were breaking and there was a lot of reasons for them but people were getting hurt and uh, they had to find out why. And many times it was misusing the tool, using it for something it wasn't designed for, or buying tools that were not the proper quality to be used as they were. So buy the best you can. If you're buying from Sheffield, England, Sheffield, England has made steel and cutlery for what, 800 years? Um, I think that they know what they're doing at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, the quality of their, of their steel is, uh, is by far the best. Now, not to say it's the only ones you can buy. You can buy, um, well, Glacier was around for a while. He sold the company, and that company's been in and out, and he keeps threatening to come back. Uh, so they're pretty much gone. Uh, Doug Thompson sells tools. Um, my experience with them has not been good, but other people love them. They say they're great. Um, PNN from Australia is good. Um, what are you going to say? I was going to ask you, uh, the Japanese, Japanese have a reputation for good steel. Do they have any? I don't know that the Japanese make turning tools. I don't know of any turning tools that they make specifically. They make, I think the reason why is, is Japan has more production turners than any place in the other country in the world and they make their own tools. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So there's not a market in Japan for turning tools. If you sent this tool, this is a spindle gouge, if you spent this, sent this to Japan to the average wood turner and look at it and say, what is that? They don't have a clue. Their turning style is very different than ours. They use washing machine motors. They use, I, I kid you not, that's what they use. And it's a direct drive, and they put this spring steel that's sharpened as a chuck, and they hammer on the piece of wood, and that's how they turn. They don't use a, st a standard tool rest they use a, a looks like a, a, a small saw horse that's on an angle, and they move it, and that's how they change the height of their tool rest. They turn totally different than we do, so they have no reason to make what we make. Also, their manufacturing costs are higher now considerably than they were a couple of years ago, so it's all sent to Ch uh, China. Uh, Pinnacle, I was starting to get the Pinnacle. Look on the radius of that tool. You'll see they're not, it's not a complete radius. They'll have flats in it. They'll have, they're, they're just poorly made. Um, but you know, that's what people, they spend less money, they don't know any better. Yes? One way, who's the name on some tools? Do you know anything about their scale? One way? Yeah. One way is very good. As a matter of fact, here's one way right here. Uh, one way makes a really great set of tools that I really like. Um, I travel a lot, and I keep telling myself that I'm just gonna bring tools like this and uh, save on you know uh, the amount of tools I've got to bring. This is double-sided, and I've got a different grind on each end. And I've got this in a lot of different sizes. So uh, theoretically, I can bring one handle and 15 tools, but I don't. I still bring them all. So. Another question, if I may. Sure. Uh, they say that you actually transfer the grind of your stone onto your work, and two cores just transfers that very coarse grind into your wood, but you spend more time sanding it. Who told you that? I just, I've read it some days. Really? I read an awful lot. I've never read that. It's Stands there and holds and gets all those ragged edges. That's Alan, that's Alan Lacer. Yeah. First class I ever took was Alan Lacer. It was kind of interesting. You had the freehand grind and you couldn't use a chuck. And uh, very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, he was a good guy. We made a lot of tools. We did a lot of things. But his style is completely different than 99% of the people in this country. Very interesting style, but different. So if we get 20 people in a room, 20 professional returners in a room, you will not find two that agree on anything. That's just the way it is. It's just, yes? Barry, what are the two grits you use on your grinder? Okay. This is a poor example. This happens to be 100, and this is 60. No, this is 80. 
80. I'm sorry. 60 and 80. 60 and 80. But my workhorse grinders, I have 46 and 80. 46 and 80. Yeah. 46 I use when I shape a tool. Um, it's quick. I want to get done. So I want it to go real quick. And the 80 I find is a good stone for general sharpening. It works real well for me. While we're on that topic, we may as well continue with it. Um, I want to talk about the quality of tools only because you asked at this point. I was going to bring it up later. Um, does anybody know where the cutting edge on this tool is? Does anybody know how we make this sharp? No, huh? Okay. It's the flute. Everybody thinks it's the bevel. It's not. It's the flute. Okay? What happens is, as I grind the bevel back, I'm exposing a new part of the flute. And that's the part that's sharp. Now, if you look at a lot of tools that are made in countries other than Sheffield, England, you'll find striations down here because they'll pull it across a mandrel and actually you'll see stretch marks, you'll see all kinds of tooling marks, but that's very, very rough in here. So understand that. If that's rough and I'm exposing that cutting edge, which is exposing the flute, now my, my cutting edge is almost like a sawtooth. So when you look at tools, how do I know it's quality? Well, first of all, I need to know that the steel is good quality steel. But I also need to look at the flute and make sure the flute is smooth. Many people take a, um, a piece of MDF, put it on a, either a motor or, or on their lathe, and they'll shape the top of the MDF to the shape of the profile of the flute. And they'll put a honing compound on it and lay the tool over the top and run it back and forth and actually polish the surface. Now people look at it and say, why are you doing that? because that's actually your cutting edge. Every time you grind that bevel back, what you're doing is exposing more of that cutting edge. And so by polishing it, now you have a smooth. I'm not anal like that, I don't do those kind of things, I don't think it's necessary, but that's what a lot of people do. Again, if you buy quality tools, look down there, you'll see. It's very, very smooth. Um, I don't want to get into the profiles and stuff yet, I want to finish with the grinder and then we'll get back to this, but you guys are asking about the tools, that's why I went to that. Okay, so we've got the grinder, we've got the wheels, J, K, the grit, like I said, for me, I like 46 and 80. This happens to be a little different because this is set up with the uh, S SG wheel, which is set up for the different steels. So that's why this has finer wheels on it than I would normally use. Okay, now you're gonna need a good jig. Now, a lot of people freehand grind. I myself freehand grind from time to time. I have a tool here that can only be freehand ground, and I'll explain that in a little while. But you need a good jig. Uh, many of the turners were inter interviewed years ago. As a matter of fact, the AAW sent out a, a, a video on sharpening. I don't know if you recall you getting that a couple years back. Well, anyway, if you ask a lot of the same people who swore up and down that uh, jigs were for beginners or for, you know, ah, I can't waste that kind of time, check now and ask them. They're all using jigs, every one of them. And the reason for that is it's repeatable. It's, it's, it's always the same angle, and you save an awful lot of steel. Now, does that matter? Probably a bowl gouge lasts most of you, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I don't know. Anybody replace a bowl gouge more often than that, except in the beginning? Because in the beginning, like I said, you start with the tool that long, the first time you sharpen it, it's like that. <laughs> but um, basically, a tool will last you a long time. I go through, I say two to three bowl gouges of each size every year. I go through spindle gouges one every four months. Uh, I go through a lot of steel. Why? Because I turn a lot, and I'm constantly sharpening. And so I'll go through these tools, but if you use, if you're freehand grinding, okay, you have no control over keeping just a minute amount of steel from coming off. Because what you're doing is, you're grinding it, you look at it, say, well, it's not perfect, I got a little nick right there, okay, I got a little flat spot. Even though you do it 100 times a day, it's not perfect. But if you put it in a jig, the angles are the same every time, muscle memory, which is what we all turn by, stays the same. You know how to put the tool up to your, to your work and get it to cut because it's the same every time. It's consistent. So even the experts who said, I'll never use jigs are all using them now.